Asian nightmare. The new Japanese target, Port Moresby, only 300 miles north of Australia, key to a vast strategic area. Daily come the bombers, daily comes destruction. Port Moresby blocks Japan's complete control of New Guinea, of Australia. It must be smashed. It must be taken. The form of the Bolowen Stanley mountain range stands between the Japanese base of Buna in northern New Guinea and Fort Moresby in the south. Miles of jagged hills and gloomy gorges, steep escarpments and trackless jungle, a frightful natural barrier. But in July 1942, the Japanese began to move over the mountain. In their earlier amphibious attempt to take Fort Moresby, they were turned back by the United States Navy at the Battle of the Coral Sea. Now the Japanese are forced into an overland trek of 1,000 man-killing miles to reach their target. Outside Port Moresby, where the Japanese must be met and stopped, is a steamy, tangled nightmare of tropical undergrowth and malarial mountain. This is the part of the world called Melanesia, the Black Islands. For the Allied soldiers, sailors and airmen who must throw back the Japanese, the Melanesian nightmare begins. Papuan guides thread the troops through the jungle labyrinth. Australian infantry has stopped the Japanese a scant 30 miles from Port Moresby. Now it is the Allies who must advance through torturous New Guinea against a foe fiercely resisting. The Allies push inexorably forward into the strategic Dobodura Plain with its vital airstrip, only six miles from New Guinea's north coast. The Japanese retreat becomes a rout. Enemy garrisons give up Buna, Gona, Sanananda, north coast bases that will serve as stepping stones for future Allied advance. For both sides, the campaign has been a horror of death, wounds, disease.
in March 1943, American air reconnaissance discovers a major Japanese move to strengthen their hold on the rest of New Guinea. A troop convoy of 16 ships sets out from Rabaul and heads into the Bismarck Sea. A dispatch has come indicating eight enemy troop transports and eight destroyers on the way. Allied airmen make ready to nullify the Japanese threat with every available plane, bomb, bullet. Bismarck Sea is a major victory of planes over ships. All eight enemy transports are sunk. More than 3,000 Japanese soldiers perish. Only four destroyers escape. Throughout the United States, shipyards are building a new amphibious navy, and strange new ships called LST, landing ship tanks. These will change the pattern of war. The Second World War has evolved into the first great amphibious conflict in history, and landing craft take priority over destroyers, carriers, and everything else. Down the rivers of the United States, into the oceans of the world, plod the LSTs. ship tanks, but she will be used for everything else as well, and loading her for combat becomes a job for experts. The 2,100 tons of materiel she carries must be stowed aboard in precise sequence and proper order, so that what is needed worst can be put ashore quickest when she joins battle on some remote beachhead. Australia. Throughout the Southwest Pacific, the Allies shift from dogged defense to spirited assault. Beginning in the summer of 1943, the men, the ships, the materiel flow in a massive surge west and north toward Mindanao and the distant Philippines. General MacArthur's strategy has long called for an advance along the New Guinea-Mindanao axis. This advance will be borne largely by small amphibious craft, a navy without glamour. These men know only hard work, hard living, hard fighting and hard won victories. Now the LSTs, the floating garages, come into their own. Loading techniques blueprinted in advance become actuality. Pile it in, stuff them full, and every item finds its designated place.
Harper, Supreme Commander, Southwest Pacific Area, accompanies the assault troops with Rear Admiral Barbie, commander of the 7th Amphibious Force. I shall return, MacArthur has said, referring to the Philippines. The fulfillment has seemed remote. Now the return begins. From Sydney, from Brisbane, into the Coral Sea, into the Bismarck Sea, along the northern New Guinea coast, move the Allied armies and navies. operations carried out by the forces of several nations working in closely welded units. Ships of the Royal Australian Navy do yeoman service with the convoys, fight with all they have in battle. These are footholds along the New Guinea coast needed for Allied progress west. The approach is covered, stealthy, cloaked in darkness. And night in the convoy is tense, silent, strained. Dawn will bring the test of combat, the ordeal of fire. fight the losing battle for New Guinea. More rugged, more useful than even their designers dreamed, the LSTs nose into the shore and disgorge their torrent of supplies. The wealth and ingenuity that has made America great in peace combine to make her victorious in war.
one of his rare promises to his emperor, dictator Tojo has promised to stop the enemy's westward movement. The Imperial Japanese command, having lost the initiative, falls back on the tenacity of the foot soldier. All the strength that can be spared from other theaters is mustered to hold Western New Guinea for the empire. Operations that would have seemed sheer fantasy a year earlier become routine reality. The inland village of Nazza, which commands an escape route for the Japanese and boasts a usable airstrip, is the target. 300 planes from fields at Fort Moresby and Dobadura will lift 1,700 paratroopers, the Pacific's most spectacular airborne assault. find their footholds on New Guinea from the air or from the sea. The jungle is equally cruel, the enemy just as malevolent. But the Allied infantry learns what the Marines have proved on Guadalcanal. Skill, courage, and superior equipment defeat the Japanese. are primitive and warlike. Headhunting and sorcery are part of their lives. But an enlightened colonial administration has won their loyalty. As pathfinders and guides, they lead allied patrols through secret trails, bring up mail and supplies, and help maintain isolated outposts deep in the jungle. But it is sea power that makes possible the longest strides along the axis leading from New Guinea to Mindanao. With increasing mastery of the amphibious technique, landing follows landing on a smooth, uninterrupted schedule. Over a period of 18 months, the Allies average a new landing every 35 days. And each new foothold is converted into a staging area for the next leap along the New Guinea coast.
12 knot pace wins a new designation from the crews of the LST. Large, slow targets. But they get there. They deliver their goods, their punch. Admiral Nimitz, Commander-in-Chief of the United States Pacific Fleet, and General MacArthur work out the grand design for the westward advance. Nimitz supports MacArthur, making possible huge leapfrog jumps along New Guinea's coast. With Itape and Hollandia, the Allies will be 400 miles nearer to the goal, nearer to the Philippines. Carriers support the Hollandia operation, which is beyond the reach of land-based planes. The enemy is taken by surprise. The fine anchorage of Humboldt Bay and three airstrips are wrested from the Japanese. to cloak ever more landing crews. And the advance goes relentlessly on, north and west, Holloway, Wachta and Biak, Numpur and Sansapur. Sansapur is on the uttermost western tip of New Guinea, and with it the entire coast is in Allied hands. But the advance does not stop. In September 1944, the Allies swarm ashore on the island of Moratai, on the threshold of the Philippines. More than 135,000 enemy troops have been bypassed, cut off without hope of rescue. In a little over 12 months, Allied forces in the Southwest Pacific storm 1,300 miles closer to the heart of the Japanese Empire. security shrouds the islands. Reports from all the battlefronts tell of nothing but Japanese triumph, allied disaster. But beneath the cheering oozes out the hideous truth. Back from the battlefronts come the white boxes with the ashes of the dead, the fallen. Welcome home, young man. You were ours, and they took you away. You are no more. Suns may set and rise, but you must sleep on during one never-ending night. <laughs> 